Ladies and gentlemen, my good friend and the good friend of the Ford Presidential Library Museum, Mr. Garrett Graff. Good evening, everyone. Thank you uh, so much for coming out tonight. Um, uh, it's an absolutely gorgeous day uh, here in Grand Rapids. Um, and if I wasn't speaking tonight, I probably would be outside enjoying the evening. So um, I appreciate all of you making the time to come and join us on uh, what is a very weird anniversary to be uh, marking, um, and certainly not an anniversary that uh, G. Gordon Liddy and Howard Hunt could have ever imagined that uh, people would be gathering across the country to mark in various uh, ways tonight. So it's my pleasure um, very specifically to be here uh, at the Ford uh, Museum. Uh, I am, as a historian, a huge believer and fan of our presidential libraries and museums. Uh, I think that they are some of our nation's sort of greatest historical treasures. Uh, and I like to pretend every year when I write my check to the US Treasury that 100% of my taxes go to support the National Archives. Um, uh, and this was actually uh, a, f a funny book to write because uh, it, this turned out to be my uh, pandemic project. I was here in uh, the fall of 2019 talking about my 9-11 uh, book, as Joel mentioned, uh, and was about 20,000 words into the book in March of 2020 when the world shut down and wrote the, or the rest of the book uh, in the midst of the pandemic in uh, my home in Vermont. And uh, wrote uh, half of it drinking out of the Gerald Ford uh, Presidential Library Museum mug uh, <laughs> that I had been given uh, in my last visit. So I was thinking of Gerald Ford almost every morning when I was working on this book. Um, so I wanted to sort of talk about, th this is, I'm just super excited for tonight. This is, uh, I'm uh, looking forward to the conversation with you all tonight and then um, you know, just really excited to hear um, Brian Lamb and, and Richard Norton Smith speak next. I mean, this is like a, a incredible lineup to be part of tonight. And so, uh, the part that I wanted to sort of talk about in my remarks tonight is uh, three different aspects of the Watergate story. The first is what attracted me to this story. The second is how our myth of Watergate uh, sort of uh, misdirects us and, and, has, and that has sort of misled us as a country uh, over the last 50 years. And then the third uh, bit that I want to talk a little bit about tonight is how Watergate has shaped our country since. So I was drawn to the story of Watergate because I spent the last, uh, whatever we are now, five, seven years of my career covering the, the Trump administration and covering um, the Russian attack on the 2016 election, the Mueller investigation. Um, Bob Mueller was actually the subject of one of my first books um, when he was FBI director and so covered his investigation uh, very closely, the first impeachment. And that led me to be interested in these questions of sort of the last time our country tackled these questions of how you investigate a president. And you might think and you might uh, very well uh, believe sort of what new could there possibly be about Watergate 50 years later. This is one of the most documented and uh, most told stories of modern American political history. Uh, and you would be right except for the fact that what I was so surprised by as I got deeper into my research is how little of the story that we think we lived through and knew and understood of what unfolded from 1972 to 1974 is actually what happened during Watergate. And so my goal with this book was to try to tell the full story of Watergate, start to finish, soup to nuts. 
and to try to recontextualize and retell the story of what transpired during that time, knowing everything that we know now. Because one of the things that we've come to understand is that Watergate is not an event that uh, as much as we think of Watergate as the burglary that happened 50 years ago tonight, uh, or, or this morning, I guess, uh, at the Watergate office complex, the way that we have come to understand Watergate is that it was a mindset and that it was an umbrella for about a dozen interrelated but distinct scandals with overlapping players that unfold from 1968 at the beginning of Richard Nixon's presidential campaign through 1974, of which the burglary and the dirty tricks of the 72 campaign are only one of ultimately the scandals that come to encompass Watergate. And that they all stem from this dark, paranoid, criminal, conspiratorial mindset that Richard Nixon brings to the presidency that has followed him, driven him through his entire career, and ultimately leads to his downfall. And that this is part and parcel of who Richard Nixon is. And I think that this, this is part of what makes the Watergate story so fascinating to me, is Richard Nixon, by almost any measure, would be among the most consequential presidents of the 20th century. He is one of the two or three most important presidents of the American century. He is the hinge upon which the entire 20th century in America turns as he ushers out the liberal consensus of the New Deal and the Great Society, the FDR, LBJ era, and turns his party and our country towards this more racialized, nativist, populist, fear-mongering Republican Party embodied in the Southern strategy that he and John Mitchell bring forward in 68 that we sort of later see in the uh, in, the, in the Reagan revolution that is really, I think, actually in many ways the Nixon revolution first. But Richard Nixon was the president who brought detente to the Cold War with the Soviet Union. He opens up China. He is the first president to visit Moscow, the first president to visit Beijing, the first president to visit a communist bloc country in the Cold War. He is the president who winds down the Vietnam War. He signs Title IX. He declares war on cancer. He breaks the gold standard for America. He creates OSHA. He creates the EPA. He brings in a 1,000 women into the middle management of the federal government and the first female military aides to the White House. From 1952 to 1972, he's on the national presidential ticket five times, a record tied only by FDR himself. Richard Nixon is on the cover of Time magazine more than any other human being in American history, a total of 55 Time magazine covers over the course of his career, more than a year of news magazine covers at a time when the news magazine was the primary news vehicle for the American household. I mean, this is the man who shapes so much of American politics, who wants so much to be a great man and to build what he calls these monuments of policy achievement. And yet, at the end of the day, he is brought low by this dark, paranoid, criminal, conspiratorial, insecure mindset that dogs him and drives him and unravels effectively his presidency from 1972 to 1974, undoing all of the greatness that he had hoped to achieve. You know, a hundred years from now, the thing that Americans, the thing that history will remember of Richard Nixon is the one word of Watergate. And that as we now understand it, 
Watergate was a very different series of events with a lot of different players and different motivations than what we lived through at the time. And there are two big ones that I put at the heart of my telling of Watergate that really have only come, uh, that we've only come to understand really in the last 10 or 15 years, uh, you know, 40, 50 years after the fact, that really change our understanding of what Watergate actually was. The first is, uh, of course, the identity of Deep Throat, the, this most famous anonymous source in American history. The, the, the man um, you know, who becomes this icon in the movie All the President's Men, which uh, some of you, I'll bet, were at the showing yesterday, uh, you know, Hal Holbrook standing in the parking garage telling Robert Redford, follow the money. We believed for 30 years that this was some Nixon insider who was, you know, disgusted with the corruption that he saw in the Oval Office and was out there fighting for democracy, you know, protecting truth, justice, and apple pie. And that's not who Deep Throat actually turns out to be. And that we now understand in 2005 that Deep Throat was the deputy director of the FBI, Mark Felt. And Mark Felt is actually not a Nixon insider disgusted by the corruption that he sees at the Oval Office. Mark Felt is actually someone who almost anyone who has ever worked in an office has worked with. He's a bitter bureaucrat passed over for a promotion that he thinks is his, who then makes it his personal mission to sink the guy who got the promotion instead of him. And so Mark felt six weeks before Watergate, he has spent his entire career as an FBI agent rising through the ranks of J. Edgar Hoover's FBI to become basically J. Edgar Hoover's heir apparent. He, he has fought a decade of bitter succession battles inside the FBI and is the last man standing. He has vanquished the two other internal rivals for this job. And six weeks before the Watergate burglary, J, uh, J. Edgar Hoover dies in his sleep. And for a couple of hours, Mark Felt thinks that he's about to get the job that he has waited his entire life to have. And then Nixon does the unthinkable and appoints this outsider, this Nixon loyalist named Patrick Gray. And Mark Felt decides that it's now his personal mission to sink Pat Gray and get the job that he wants, FBI director. And the Watergate burglary happens, and Mark Felt becomes this prodigious leaker, not because he cares about Richard Nixon, but because he cares about embarrassing Pat Gray. And that, as it turns out, there are these fascinating moments that we now understand that Mark Felt actually knows highly damaging information about Richard Nixon that he never bothers to tell anyone because he doesn't actually really care about Richard Nixon at all. And it doesn't serve his purpose to sink, uh, sink Richard Nixon. It's, it serves his purpose to sink Pat Gray. And so he starts out first leaking to Sandy Smith at Time Magazine. Then he leaks to the Washington Daily News. The Washington Daily News happens to go out of business in July of 1972 and then he turns to this young reporter that he's mentored through uh, the young reporter's career named Bob Woodward at the Washington Post. And it's only at that moment that we begin to see sort of Deep Throat emerge in the way that we have sort of always thought of Deep Throat in this uh, movie role from Hal Holbrook. And there's this fascinating sort of historical moment and historical what if is if the Washington Daily News had kept publishing for a couple more months, would any of us have ever known the names Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein? The second sort of major thing that changes our understanding of Watergate 
is this new set of revelations that has come out in the last decade from documents declassified at the LBJ Presidential Library about what is known as the Chenault Affair. And the Chenault Affair uh, was an event that was poorly understood until relatively recently. And until relatively recently, we didn't understand that it was connected to Watergate at all. And in 2011, this set of documents comes out of the LBJ Presidential Library. And we understand now that effectively, Watergate begins not in 1972, but in 1968. And that in the fall of 1968, Richard Nixon, running for president, Remember, so this is 68, former vice president, private citizen, Richard Nixon, running against Hubert Humphrey, sitting vice president. Fall of 1968, Lyndon Johnson broken by Vietnam, desperate to bring the war to a close, convenes the Paris peace talks. Richard Nixon and his campaign director, John Mitchell, work with this Washington doyen named Anna Chenault to send a message to the South Vietnamese government to stall the Paris peace talks. And Nixon says effectively, if you wait, I'll give you a better deal than Johnson would give you. And to put a very fine point on this, Nixon tries to keep the Vietnam War going in the fall of 1968 for his personal political benefit. Johnson discovers this in the literal final hours of the campaign. Uh, this sort of plays out all over the course of the weekend leading into the election, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, leading into the Tuesday election. And Johnson confronts Nixon. Nixon denies it, and the clock runs out. And Johnson now realizes that He's, he sort of can't make a big deal about this. It's bad for the country. It's bad for the presidency. It's bad for the moral authority and legitimacy of, uh, of the new president-elect, Richard Nixon. And so he classifies and buries the whole thing. But Nixon knows that Johnson knows. And so this becomes this Edgar Allan Poe, telltale heart style treachery, this secret that Richard Nixon has at the core of his presidency that he is desperate to keep secret. And what we now understand is that it is this Chenault affair that helps drive Richard Nixon's wild overreaction to the Pentagon Papers in the spring of 1971. Because what we, uh, uh, it, it's sort of always been this puzzle. Why did Richard Nixon so wildly overreact to the Pentagon Papers? The Pentagon Papers should be one of the greatest days of Richard Nixon's life. There are two million words in the Pentagon Papers, not a single one of which is Nixon. They are all about the lies and misdeeds and mendacity of the Johnson administration and the Kennedy administration, his two mortal political enemies. And Nixon, though, is terrified that the leaks of the Pentagon Papers are going to lead to leaks about the Chenault affair. And he becomes convinced that there's a series of documents at the Brookings Institution, the think tank in Washington, about the Chenault affair. And so on the White House tapes, there's no sign that Richard Nixon knew of the Watergate burglary in advance or gave the order in 72. But he's on the tapes in 71 repeatedly ordering the burglary of the Brookings Institution to steal back these papers about the Chenault affair. And the White House comes up with what it thinks is a great plan. They're going to bring up the burglars from, uh, from Florida, the Cuban burglars who go on to be the burglars caught at the Watergate in 72. 
They're going to dress them up as DC firefighters. They equip them with a secondhand fire truck, uh, sort of marked up and decorated as if it's a DC fire truck. They're going to firebomb the Brookings Institution. And in the chaos of the firefighting, they're going to send these burglars into the uh, into Brookings to break into the vault and steal back these papers on the Chenault affair. There is, by the way, no sign that these papers ever exist. They have never surfaced. There's no sign. This, this appears to be some sort of very weird uh, game of telephone gone wrong uh, because there's no sign that this set of papers, which, which was known as the bombing halt study, uh, ever exists. The plan falls apart, according to G. Gordon Liddy, not because someone at some point says, this is one of the wildest, uh, most insane plans that anyone has ever come up with involving a president, and you could, this is super criminal, and we should definitely not do this. It falls apart because, according to G. Gordon Liddy, the White House is too cheap to buy the fire truck. <laughs> And what we come to understand, though, is that it is sort of this operation and the operation targeting Daniel Ellsberg that leads to the creation of what we now know as the Plumbers Unit, this team in the summer of 71 that comes together to, in response to the Pentagon Papers with G. Gordon Liddy, E. Howard Hunt, and ultimately sort of morphs into the team that uh, breaks into uh, Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office in California in the fall of 71. Then Gordon Liddy go goes on, of course, to head up the dirty tricks operation for the campaign uh, in this, um, in the course of, of 72. And that th this sort of thread we now understand in some ways uh, is why Nixon can't come clean about the Watergate burglary in 72. Is that, uh, I'm also, by the way, skipping over about a half dozen other scandals that figure into this that have, are also underway by the spring of 72. Um, where basically by the spring of 72, by the time the DC police arrest the five burglars at the Watergate, there's simply so many conspiracies, so many schemes, and so many crimes underway in the Nixon White House that they can't come clean about any of them because sort of pulling on any one of these threads they fear is going to lead to the unraveling of everything else. And so this becomes this uh, sort of new way of looking at these events where Vietnam and the Pentagon Papers and Watergate are not three separate events, but in fact sort of all the same story of how sort of Nixon's mind corrupts his administration and leads to the unraveling of uh, his, his White House from 72 to 74. Um, so uh, let me talk a little bit about um, the, the, the sort of why Watergate still matters to us today, um, and then open it up for, for some questions. Um, the, Watergate, in the same way that sort of Nixon, I think, is the hinge upon which the 20th century turns, Watergate is the hinge upon which Washington turns. And that Watergate, in many ways, creates our modern Washington and our modern politics. And we see this in ways big and small, that it creates you know, our modern structure of campaign finance reform and civil liberties and privacy law and surveillance and government oversight. It brings 100 new members of Congress to Washington as part of the Watergate babies, ushering out an era 
of Southern segregationist committee chairs, World War I veterans, and bringing in this much more reform-oriented, transparency-oriented Congress. It creates the modern structure of executive branch oversight. You know, when we sit through today the January 6th hearings, you know, I've spent a lot of this week sort of talking about the analogs between January 6th, the January 6th hearings and the Irvin Committee hearings. We forget how new the Irvin Committee hearings were, though, in 1973 when Sam Irvin and Sam Dash began to try to put together those hearings. When that committee was getting started, Congress just didn't really do oversight in the way that we are now used to. They actually have to go back to, the, to Congress's investigation of the Battle of Bull Run in 1861 to look at the analog of the types of hearings that they want to hold. And of course, this becomes one of the things that we are sort of most used to seeing Congress do, is carry out these types of hearings. The very battles that we are living through right now over executive privilege grow directly out of Watergate. Executive privilege being codified in the Supreme Court battle over the Nixon tapes. That this is uh, you know, something that we are still very much living with the shadow of today. And of course, it creates this incredible change in the way that the press and the media sort of reflect on and look at our government and cause this incredible uh, collapse of faith in America's uh, institutions, one that I think we're sort of still very much struggling with uh, the legacy of today. You know, Watergate is this thing that continues to fascinate us today because we are still living day to day with so much of the ramifications of this story. I think I've got about 15 uh, minutes left or so here. Um, so let me open it up to some questions uh, and we can talk a little bit more about this. Any questions? <laughs> yes? You, you teased this a little bit with mentioning January 6th hearings, but you didn't really elaborate on how you think the Watergate situation informs what we're seeing today also, maybe how the party has responded. Yeah. January 6th versus Watergate. Yeah. So uh, let me uh, let me talk a little bit uh, um, uh, about that in, in the sort of specific context of then and now. Um, so it, the Watergate hearings were uh, a, a must-see TV event, sort of unlike anything America had ever experienced until then. Um, I am guessing some of you remember watching them uh, yourself. 11 weeks of hearings in that summer of 73, 237 hours of televised hearings. The average American household watched 30 hours of hearings. 80% of America watched the, uh, an average uh, of, of 30 hours. You know, that's basically a works week's worth of hearings over the course of the 11 weeks of that summer. I mean, an incredible level of civic participation and civic engagement. And the committee thought really long and hard about how to structure that. And, and you know, America was not initially that interested in Watergate, um, e even at the start of the hearings. Um, there were all sorts of complaints about them, the hearings interrupting the soap operas. And then America sort of came to realize that there was a much more interesting soap opera playing out in these Watergate hearings. And the hearings started in a very methodical narrative where they didn't start out with sort of the biggest blockbusters. They started out with, you know, days and weeks of, you know, org charts and signing authorities and sort of understanding who the players were and how, uh, you know, how the Nixon campaign worked. Because you had to understand how the campaign worked before you could begin to understand the people. And it was almost a month before John Dean ends up 
uh, taking the stage uh, in the hearings. Um, John Dean becomes sort of, of course, this electrifying moment, uh, the, uh, the, the, the architect of the cover-up turned state's witness speaking to the committee uh, and to America, his fetching wife behind him. I mean, the, this was, uh, you know, some of the most fascinating TV of that summer. And he came across as very credible and very sympathetic. And then over the course of the summer, you know, you had Ehrlichman, you had Halderman, you had Mitchell um, all up there and all, uh, you know, sort of speaking to the country and speaking to the committee in a way that the country just became fascinated by. Um, and then and now, I think one of the most interesting aspects of this is the, so w Watergate is at one level a story of a corrupt and criminal president. Um, uh, you know, I think one of the great myths that we have of Watergate is sort of the adage that we have heard in every scandal since of, you know, well, Watergate always showed the cover up is worse than the crime. Um, and, and in fact, that's not true with Watergate, that actually Nixon's crimes are the actual problem. And the, the cover up sort of is this relatively incidental thing. Um, and that what, what we see come through is, yes, this story of a corrupt and criminal president. At the same time, it's, I think, a hopeful and optimistic story of how the American system works. And it works because of this incredible ballet, this incredible dance that takes place from 72 to 74 of how our checks and balances work together, how Article I, Article II, Article III, the Bill of Rights come together and every institution in Washington plays a part in forcing Richard Nixon from office. The FBI, the Justice Department, the media, the House, the Senate, the District Court, the Appeals Court, the Supreme Court, everyone has to do something and has to play a certain role in order for the end result to be Nixon leaving office. And what you see, particularly in the House and the Senate, is that the Republicans participate in good faith in that process. And that they come to it with an open mind they listen to the evidence, and they understand most of all that they have a role in our constitutional system where they have a responsibility and a prerogative as members of the legislative branch to hold the co-equal executive branch to account. And that their duty as legislators, as members of, the, uh, uh, members of Congress, as members of the House and the Senate, outweighs their responsibilities as partisan Republicans. And that what we see is that that takes place in both the House and the Senate. And it takes place across the Republican spectrum. Um, you know, Lowell Weicker, uh, moderate uh, on the Ur Republican on the Urban Committee, Howard Baker, uh, sort of the you know, center of the Republican Party, and even conservative standard bearer uh, Barry Goldwater, you know, um, you know the, the minority leader John Rhodes. Um, you know, these, each of these people in the Republican Party sort of plays a role in helping to bring Richard Nixon to justice in the summer of 74. And to me, this is... Uh, I think a really important lesson for us in what it takes to protect and preserve American democracy. Um, and I think one of the things that all the president's men uh, misleads us in, in sort of the mythology of Watergate, is sort of this idea that it was like Woodward, Bernstein, yada, 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 Nixon resigns. And in fact, that there was a whole... Uh, spectrum of heroes uh, who help play important roles in protecting and preserving American democracy. And in fact, the whole system begins to break down the moment any one of those people stop playing the role that is necessary 
um, in, in, under our constitutional system. So that um, is, uh, uh, to me, sort of the things that I'm looking at and thinking about sort of then to now. So down here. Oh, uh, uh, Mike. You're... Um, just to follow up on that uh, question, how much of that, I don't know, congressional nobility or patriotism was a function of uh, personal values, or did they feel there would be a political consequence if they didn't hold Nixon accountable? So was it really them kind of looking in their hearts, or were they looking at their future if they didn't pursue yeah. this? Um, so it's a good question, and, and it, I, I think one of the things that's hard to remember about Watergate um, is the extent to which it was so shocking that Nixon would lie to the American people. Um, you know, so much of, and I sort of trace this in the book, that so much of sort of the early phase of the congressional investigation, so much of the early press reaction is people, you know, high-powered important reporters and, you know, important members of Congress saying, basically, Nixon said he wasn't involved. Like, Guy said he didn't, he didn't have anything to do with it. Like, you know, let's move on. And then sort of them saying, you know, we can't impeach the president. He's the president. Um, and sort of only with time and the accumulation of his actions and his lies and, you know, the Saturday Night Massacre um, and the ways that he misleads about what's on the tapes, the way that he sort of makes it... Uh, 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 you know, the 18 and a half minute gap, the, the um, you know, sort of each of these moments erodes Richard Nixon's credibility until in the summer of 74, he has no credibility left when the Supreme Court forces the release of his tapes and he says um, that he, uh, and, and the smoking gun tape comes out showing that he effectively had been a willing and eager participant in the cover-up from the very start. Um, and I think part of the irony of this is that the shock of Watergate was so great, the collapse in America's faith in its institutions and its government and the presidency uh, so changed that it has made every subsequent political scandal less shocking, um, and, and that in a weird way, sort of Nixon's, the, the, the sinking of Richard Nixon has made it easier for every subsequent politician to survive. Because, you know, now we very much start from a different position uh, as a country, as a press, as a, a party, where it's sort of, you know, everybody lies. You know, everybody's doing dastardly things. And, we you know, it's a much more cynical culture that we have politically. Um, and, and, and I think that that is one of the weird sort of tragedies and ironies of Watergate it is, is that it has uh, made sort of every president since uh, be able to sort of skate on behavior that, uh, not every president since, it has made presidential scandals since uh, sort of easier to get past because we are sort of more used to our presidents lying to us. So, all right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Garrett.